Welcome to the podcast where relationships, confidence, and determination all converge into an amazing heartfelt experience. This is Speaking from the Heart. Welcome back to episode number 84 of Speaking from the Heart. And today we have a happiness expert with us that will be talking about a variety of different subjects as it relates to the concept of being happy. Her name is Perrette, and as I mentioned, she is an expert in happiness, but also self-proclaims herself as the happiest person in the world. Her goal is to influence everyone to enjoy and celebrate life, to create more joyful energy in our world. In her teachings, she uses mixed modalities, and some of them include mindfulness, movement, subliminal conversation, and neuro-linguistic programming. She is originally from Estonia and has been living in the United States, in Florida specifically, since 2004. She's the author of the book, Joyful Life Jumpstart, and also hosts her own YouTube channel and podcast called Happiness with Pirette, which I was fortunate enough to also be on her show to talk about the topic of anxiety, which I will put a link in the episode notes if you want to go and check her out, particularly about my episode, along with her other episodes as well. But what I really got out of this conversation more than anything else is not to make this big overproduction of what we need to do to just figure out what we need to have in our lives to be able to understand and create those best opportunities that we continuously talk about on the show. This episode really simply talks about the concept of happiness and how we can get ourselves to be there. And I think beyond anything else that we will ever do or ever say in our lives, If we can just focus on the happiness aspect of it, we can achieve greatness in so many different ways, which I think you will find our conversation not only above and beyond those lines, but how she got to that point of being that happiest person in the world. Because if I was anything like her, I would love to be happy all the time, and I know that I can strive to be that based on our conversation that we had today. But with that, let's go to the episode. All right, we're here with Perrette. Perrette, thanks for sharing your heart with us today. Hi, Joss. Thank you. Thank you for having me in your show. Yeah, absolutely. This is really a return favor because I was recently on your show a number of months ago, and I really was excited that I was part of it. We connected, and we're like, hey, why don't you have me on the show? I'm like, perfect. Let's do that. So thanks so much for taking some time to talk with us today. I really want to start with this question because I already introduced you to the audience and many people are probably scratching their heads when I introduced you saying, what's a happiness expert? I never heard of such a concept before. So in your own experience and in your own words, can you let our audience know what a happiness expert is? Well, the way I see it as well and why I started using that. So I've been a happy person since I remember myself. So it's kind of lucky or I don't think, I don't say it's lucky, but I'm being happy inside since I remember. But there were points of life when I saw other people not having the same feeling and not being able to be the way I was. So in one point I started thinking, well, how can I teach them or help them to feel the same way? And why I decided that after learning everything, how other people were teaching happiness and everything, I learned that a lot of people who teach happiness, they actually by themselves, they're not happy. They just teach facts like science behind the happiness, what to do, but then they start talking how they themselves, they don't feel it. And that's why I was like, the way I think I'm an expert, because first of all, I am happy. I'm expert because I'm happy. Why I can teach others? Because I know how it feels and I know how to teach others what I feel. So I wanted to share what I have with others. I learned how to do it. I didn't just start like this. I learned also how to teach. I love that because a lot of people sometimes go through life feeling absolutely miserable. And I can tell numerous examples to you and even the audience, my listeners, about how some of those people have been a negative influence on me because I let their negativity, their unhappiness rub off on me. But I actually found this really interesting, and I want to let the audience know this too, again, that 
you lived in Estonia for a period of time up until about 2004. You lived in Florida. Why did you move to the United States? I'm just curious what that background story is. Well, I was born in Estonia. Actually, I was born when it was still under Russia. So I was about 10 years old when it was separated from Russia again. And when I moved here, I kind of had a feeling that I want to move here since I was 16. I don't know why. And then when I finally moved, I was about 23. And it's actually a funny story as well. I did a training for hospitality and I had a choice. We had really cold winter, but I had a choice as for our hospitality training to go to my internship either in England or in Florida. So that was the easy choice there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do I go to the England with the, after the cold winter? Do I go to England to have more cold or do I go to Florida? So that's how I ended up in the United States. I imagine then you must have fell in love with being in the sunny weather of Florida, which I've been to Florida a few times. I've been to Disney World. I have enjoyed it, but it's something that I love the four seasons so living where i'm at in pennsylvania is something that i absolutely don't want to give up whatsoever but it is it something that you enjoy just being down there in florida and enjoying the weather does that make you happy <laughs> sure sure that's a little bit different as well because i do like florida but i like four seasons as well i actually do prefer four seasons but summertime in florida is really hard because summer is where everybody else in other places in the country, they can go out and play. Here is so hot, you have to see the inside. So, you know, like on cold, somewhere cold, like I have people, friends in Canada, and then in the winter time, they pretty much can't go out as much. Yeah. In the summertime in Florida, we just go from inside the building to the car and then inside the building again because it's just too hot to be outside. <laughs> See, I think it was the opposite from some people that I've heard, but I won't go into that right now. Yeah. <laughs> but winter time, I do like it in the winter time when I see on a TV that everybody else is in the snow and I have sunny weather outside. That's when I do like it. I think that we all have our seasons that we enjoy. I enjoy fall so much just because of the leaves turning and having the cooler weather, things of that nature. So I think there's some people that absolutely appreciate it, and I guess that's just how they check into their happiness, which, Perrette, just getting back to what we were just talking about with your being a happiness expert, I noticed that you do a lot of different types of techniques, but the one thing that stood out to me the most when you work with people is doing neuro-linguistic programming. Can you talk a little bit about your approach to that? Because it's something that I'm sure our audience has no idea or maybe have never heard of it. I know I personally have never heard of it, so I would love to hear a little bit about how you do that. Mm -hmm. Well, neuro-linguistic programming is pretty much working with the thoughts in your head and thoughts that you're saying to yourself, especially your self-talk. So we pay attention on what are we talking inside, listening what your thoughts, you tell me what you're thinking. And we're going to figure out what thoughts are positive, what are negative, what are beneficial for you and what is not beneficial to you. And then the ones that not good for you, we keep them, we anchor them. Different neuro-linguistic practitioners, they use different words. The word that I use when I want to keep some thought. I say anchor, and the ones, the thoughts that I don't want to keep, I cancel them. Mm. So this way you learn, when I talk with you, I learn to keep your positive thoughts, and I cancel your negative thoughts. And after a while, the client will learn to do the same with their own thoughts. So when they have positive thoughts, they will say anchor, and it stays in their mind. And if some kind of negative thought comes to their mind, they will say cancel. Is there a certain approach in terms of a certain clientele that you use this with? In other words, does it work more effectively with people like maybe the Joe Schmo that comes off the street, maybe has nothing really serious going on in their life, and maybe that anchoring really helps them to maybe feel more focused and more positive, as opposed to somebody that has been through some trauma in their life? 
Do you see a difference with some people that you've worked with? If so, can you talk about those differences, like how impactful they have been? The way I see that people with trauma and everything, for them it's harder and takes longer practice because they still have this record in their head and it plays and it plays, it's hard to stop. If somebody who's most things in their life has been easy, it's easier for them. They don't have too many repeating thoughts. But somebody with trauma, they have not just repeating thoughts, they have repeating images. So a good thing to include with neuro-linguistic programming is guided meditation, where they actually visualize the thing. Instead of just having this talk and thoughts and speaking, they actually able to visualize the experience that they had, and then they work through that. It's almost like talking it out loud. Is that fair to say, or is it much more than that? Neuro-linguistic programming is more than that because you actually change their thoughts. With long-term practice, you're actually able to change your thoughts so those negative thoughts don't arise almost never or very rarely. That's really interesting in itself because for me, and Pirat, I shared this with you on mm -hmm. your show, and I'll share it with my listeners, just about the struggles that I've had with that self-talk because I have these scripts already in my head growing up that I need to say this in order for myself to get to point A to point B, but that same script might not always work in every single situation, and it has to change, especially with some of the circumstances that surround it. I mean, obviously, it got me into a place where I realized that if I don't make a change pretty soon, I'm going to have to make some course corrections down the road, which obviously I had to in order to adapt. Which, speaking of which, I noticed on your website you have a lot of certifications that talk about really your ability to work with others as a life coach, mental health coach. With all those certifications that you have, does that help you to understand getting into other people's ability to be able to do things like neuro-linguistic training and even some of the other techniques that you use? In other words, does this help you get more engaged with your clients? Do you feel that they appreciate that you've been through all these different types of things? I mean, I feel that, and feel free to challenge me on this because I feel that nowadays, and I've had this conversation with other coaches on my show about, yeah, we could just make a website tomorrow, call mm -hmm. ourselves a coach, and we're in business. But for many people, they don't realize that there's a discipline and also having to go through different trials and tribulations, whether in life, whether through education, whether through other means to get to where we are so we can provide that advice. Do you think that helps you become more credible? I don't think that it helps me to become more credible, but it helps me to know more. Yeah. So I like those certifications and I actually have more, but I have just some listed there that I want people to be aware of, to know what my qualifications are. But I learn from everything. I learn from books. I learn from shows. I learn from meeting people. I learn all the time. Learning is one of my main things that I love doing. Absolutely. So, because like you were saying right now, I just saw really funny posting as well, where we're saying that everybody can go now to you, YouTube university. <laughs> it's like, there's YouTube university. You can just graduate from there knowing everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've seen those self-proclaimed individuals and that's why I'm not out in the YouTube universe, at least not yet. And I will laugh at myself later on when I'm at episode 184 and say, yes, I finally ventured into that because I feel like I have overcome that. And so mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I totally understand that comment very well. So, Pirret, I want you to tell us a little bit about that big successful client that you've had or somebody that you worked with. And I know you work with couples, too, so that's fair game with this question. What would you say has been your successful individual or individuals that you've worked with that have were on the completely opposite spectrum of where they started and they got all the way to the other side? Of course, I'll ask you to withhold their names just for confidentiality, but I was wondering if you could share a little bit of that success with our audience. 
Yeah, that's the thing. What I always keep them really confidential. Like you said, you're going to be getting named it because there's been some authors and usually with happiness, people don't want to show other people publicly that they actually are unhappy. They don't want to know other people know that they are unhappy and that's okay. For me, that's okay for the client because they want to present them in one way, but they now actually want to feel the same way inside as well. But like you were saying, you have examples. I had some examples, especially with people just finding out that their marriage is ending and right in that moment to get them really fast to the comfort zone and figure it out everything. And I've had some people who were previous addicts. That's really hard to go with the addict to keep them going in the road. So in the beginning of when I first started coaching, I remember it was challenging in the beginning to learn to work with them. But after I figured out how to work with them, it helped as well. So I was able to keep them on the right road. So I would say that I'm most proud of. That's awesome in itself because marriage and divorce all the way to being an addict recovery Although somewhat different trends, they have some similarities in terms of how you get to that road of recovery. And you brought up something that I'm actually really curious about now. You mentioned that there's been challenges that you've had to overcome with even dealing with some of those clients and maybe even refining your practice. What would you say, especially as you started out with your practice, what would you say is your biggest challenge that you had and how did you overcome that? I'm going to be honest, Josh, with you. Biggest challenge for me was to ask money. Oh, yes. I know that game very well. I know. <laughs> Knowing your you work. And I was like, should I say the honest answer? Honest answer was to charge money because I felt like since I've been kind of doing it, even when I was younger, my friends and everybody, they came to me for advice. So they were actually, my friends, when I was in high school, they were saying you should go study psychology and everything like that. But I went on traveling and doing other things instead. <laughs> <laughs> but they came to me asking for help. So early on in even my business, I had to learn that it is about charging your worth. So even your best friend that maybe has been with you from the get-go with whatever you've been doing is about being able to still charge what you're worth and i had to learn that lesson the hard way too i think all of us do and it's just mm -hmm. a matter of realizing that we bring in value and it isn't always about the money i've talked about this i had a coach on here a sales coach by the name of kyle slaymaker early on the program that really has talked about not only knowing that worth but knowing the fact that it isn't to say that they are demeaning you or creating that opportunity for them to be able to get the fruits of what you've been doing. It's really about learning something that you have perfected or something that you have really achieved that can be shared. And I think there's no shame in that for, for sure because I learned that the hard way in itself. But actually when you get over asking your money, then it starts feeling good when yes. you're actually comfortable asking the money and people paying you that, that part already feels good. So when you overcome that feeling of, Oh, I'm going to ask money and you finally start asking the money. That is a good feeling. It is. It's almost as if you're achieving that value for yourself too. And I know for me, it's not just about having people as clients or being able to put on a workshop and have a number of attendees or things of that nature. It's really about the satisfaction of knowing that my worth is being radiated across the world through those individuals that are going forth after going through that program or going through that session that we have together. So it's always important. Perrette, I want to talk a little bit about your YouTube channel, which for my listeners, I'll put it in the episode notes so that they can access it. But I have obviously been featured on your show. I can absolutely leave a link for those that are interested in checking out when I was with you, in which we talked about 
clearly not just getting over anxiety or the biggest topic of them all because I have definitely been through the gambit of that with my story. But I love your approach in that you have several different topics that you talk about which relate to happiness, whether it's about masculinity, whether it's about communication. My favorite, which I have to go check out because I just noticed it, is about autism, which I have found out earlier last year that I was autistic. Why all these different types of topics? Because I feel like you could just focus on one niche and say, yeah, I'm going to talk about this type of happiness and be an expert about it. Why so many different topics? Are you trying to be able to cover all those different gambits and try to reach as many people as possible? I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. Oh, no. It's not about reaching as many people as possible. For me, it's because first I was planning to do just about happiness, but I realized there are so many people who don't even think about happiness yet. Mm. So I had to find some kind of platform for helping them. The reason why I did the anxiety episodes was I was trying to help the people with anxiety get to the point where they can handle their anxiety and then move towards happiness. But they can't just move straight from anxiety right to happiness. So I had to get the issue with happiness first. No, issue with anxiety first and then go towards happiness. But I had another one that I just did, the new one, what I did after happiness was, if you see the playlist, the playlist has men's guide to happiness. Mm -hmm. So that was really interesting to do because I have 20 episodes just with men about happiness and men's point of view. I like that because for so many different people, it has all kinds of different faces, perspectives, different types of dimensions to it. I can completely understand. You do something that I don't do, which is to actually live stream. And I think for my fellow listeners that don't know what that is like to be live streaming this and then being able to have it published right away, is there a a little bit of a heightened anxiety (laughs) in itself, (laughs) kind of since we're talking about that, to do those sort of episodes live? In the beginning, it could have been. (laughs) But what, what happened, what I did, Joshua, what I did, it's a good story as well. The way before I knew that I want to do live and podcast on YouTube in a video, I took a course of online on video improv classes. So the goal there is you go online and you have to look as silly as possible and do all kinds of silly things with your face, with your impressions, talking gibberish. And I did all that. I just got comfortable in front of the camera after doing all the silly things. So everybody's wondering how to learn to be on a camera. Go take some online impro classes that you have to be on a camera and doing silly things. It's just about experimenting and just getting right into it so that you feel a lot more comfortable. And that's even what I say to my public speaking clients is just do it and see where it goes and get the feedback and start doing it again. See what happens, do it again. It makes you feel a little bit better. So I completely understand that. And I love that. I actually really appreciate you being so bold enough to do that because some people are very afraid of that. Glossophobia, the fear of public speaking, even on a video format, even being live streamed can be very scary. <laughs> yeah, I think you know, maybe the first classes when I did the improv, maybe I had more anxiety then as well. But like you're saying, like the more you do it, it just goes away. So by the time I actually started my own show, I was already comfortable. And that's good. I'm glad mm-hmm. to hear that. Pirat, before we close up, I, I want to actually reference the fact that you've written a book, and it's called Joyful Life Jumpstart. And I'll also put this in the episode notes in case anybody's interested. It is available on Amazon, on your Kindle, or even a paperback. But why write a book about happiness? I will tell you that I've had some people, I've had a friend of mine, Dr. Hector Ortiz, he was recently on the show. He shared his books about the fact that in order to gain the ability to professionally grow and even have a fulfilling life, there is even a component of happiness with it. So why write a book is always my question for my authors. 
<laughs> well, this book, I have another book that I'm writing now that's more about happiness. But that, that book, Joyful Life Jumpstart, was because I wanted to give people tools how to get into a positive mindset. And the way it came to me is asking why people have feeling or start to writing a book. It was just already writing it in my mind. So it was writing in my mind by itself and I just had to start writing in a paper. I had the feeling like just start putting in a paper. And in the book, it actually teaches you how to deal with the past and figure out what you want for future and figure out where you're now and what steps you have to take to make the future joyful. I definitely could have used that book about three and a half, four years ago when I was going through what I was going through, Perrette. So I must have missed the boat when I saw that book. Although I know I see that it was only published just a few years ago. But even then, as I was going through the midst of it, I would have loved to have that kind of book in mm -hmm. my hands. Joshua, I wrote it when there was COVID lockdown. Okay. I, That's and when it, I wrote it. It's so funny to talk to people that I've had on the show that have gone through the COVID shutdown and they've had this spark of inspiration or they have really started something that they always wanted to do, but they never could have the opportunity to do so. So I always find it fascinating. I love the fact that you did that during the COVID lockdown. Barrett, we're almost at the end of our time, but before I, I let you just share a little bit about how people can reach out to you, I have one last question, and it does relate to this overall theme that we've had in this show about happiness. I've talked to a number of people in my business. I've been open for a little over a year now, and I have encountered many different people that were either not as fulfilled or not as happy as they could be. They are struggling with finding that identity of happiness because there's been some barriers that have been put along the way and that has created a lot of things for them to essentially feel a little trepidation about being able to go through and think they can have a happy, fulfilled life. If somebody listening to this would stumble across this and they are really interested in getting started on how they can be happy, what would you recommend as really that first step in achieving true happiness? What would you say is the first action item, if you will? Obviously, they could go and call you, but mm -hmm. what if they didn't have that available to you? What would you say to them? Yeah, because my program is really good. But before we get there, I would say if there's somebody who really, really doesn't know yet, they have to take a little paper or a little notebook and start writing out little things that they feel, oh, I felt happy and say like, oh, I had this good coffee and that made me feel happy. Start paying attention on those little things that make them feel happy, even if it's just for a few seconds, few minutes, but paying attention on things that make you feel good and happy. Because if you know what those things are that make you feel happy, either they're activities or just items or things, then you can have more of them in your life. Because you're already mentally, you're already paying attention that, oh, doing this walk in the morning or even just watching your favorite show, but it feels good. But you mark down that it feels good. I love that message because some people think it's about, oh, I need to start a new routine, which I did a whole series of episodes even earlier in, in this new 2024 year about having to be able to set those goals, be able to set those expectations. But it doesn't mean completely dropping everything that you used to do and do it with two feet and jumping right into it because that will set you up for disaster. So it's really about being intentional and starting with the small things. And I love that just writing it down can be the gateway to creating some of that. So thanks for yeah. sharing that. And even just noticing if you don't, if you're a person who doesn't like to write things down, at least notice that I am feeling good right now. Absolutely. Perrette, thanks so much for doing this and talking about this subject and even some of your experiences. If people are interested in reaching out to you, how can they contact you? Do you have a website that they can reach out to? 
I would love for you to take these last few minutes and pitch yourself to my listeners because I'm sure that all of us could use a little bit more happiness and maybe you can be that person for them. So I'm going to give you the last few moments here to go ahead and share that. Mm -hmm. So the best way to reach me is through my website, which is by and my name, P-I-R-E-T dot com. And from there, the most popular package and the most uh, impactful package is Access Your Happiness, which is two hour assessment session. And with that one, you're already pretty much setting yourself up for having a happier life or having a happy life for a long time. First of all, what we do there is we find out what is your happiness gatekeeper. So what's holding you back from feeling happy or acknowledging that you're happy. And then we're going to find out what are the things that make you happy. And then set goals and make a plan how to have more of those happy things in your life and how to do it. So that's my main package right now. That's a one-on-one personal thing. That's what I'm promoting right now. Wow. And I think that you... My listeners can definitely take advantage of that. You can take advantage of the fact that she's written a book. You can take advantage of the fact that I was on her show. So I'm going to put all those things in the episode notes again if you want to check those things out. But Pirette, I have to tell you, a little girl from Estonia coming to the big leagues of the United States, I think you're making a big impact with this important subject because happiness is something that we should all be able to achieve. And I'm so thankful that you have this assessment so thankful that you're leading that life and you're leading that charge especially with all the things that you're doing i appreciate you being on this show thanks for being on speaking from the heart it really has been a privilege to feel a little bit happier and a little bit more joyful (laughs) after talking with you today i really mean Mm -hmm. that thank you joshua is there time for me to say a few more things go ahead this is your time well one of the things that i wanted to share as well was because i noticed that Right now in our society, being happy is not so acceptable. People are looking for more sadness and everything. So that's why I'm sharing this and that's why I'm doing this because I want to make more people to feel that they're allowed to be happy. A lot of people holding them back, they might feel happy, but they feel that maybe I should not be feeling happy. Society is not looking for people to be happy yet, I think so. That's why it looks to me. It's all about what we are able to do to achieve not only that happiness, but to resist the fact that there are societal, cultural pressures that might be creating some of that, or even individual pressures for that matter, to be able to lead that happiness life. So, Perrette, thanks again for sharing that. Thanks Mm -hmm. again for being part of the show. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you for doing your show. It's really important. I want to thank Pirette so much for allowing me not only to be on her show, but allowing me to interview her for my own podcast, because not only has this been a conversation worth diving into, but it really dives into a simple concept in itself, which I mentioned in the beginning of this episode. Are you happy? That's it. It's as simple as that. Can you just be happy with who you are? or maybe what you want to achieve for that matter, so that you can be happy in the most simplistic form. We don't need to dive into all kinds of different types of techniques in which you can be happy. Pirate's already done that for us, and I highly encourage you to take a listen again to some of those opportunities that she has mentioned that maybe you have forgotten that could be some of those simple ways for you to be happy. But what thoughts, what self-talk do we really give ourselves That really puts us behind the reel of whether we're going to be happy on a particular day or not. And I've heard it time and time again. If you get up in bed and before you even put your two feet on the floor of your bed, you have to think about all the different blessings that you have in your life. That you're able to breathe, that you're able to eat, you'd be able to have another day in your life. But regardless of all those different things, it's just about simply what are you happy about? And I think that if we don't keep that conversation tone in place about that happiness aspect, it's going to just take longer for what we want to do to achieve what is ultimately in the cards for us. 
I don't know many of you to really decide whether I think that you're going to be happy if you just simply do that. It might be more involved. It might be more intense. It might be more exhilarating of a life that you lead to the point that you might be asking, this episode is completely out of my league. I don't think that I will ever be able to learn the happiness aspect that Pirette shared with you today, Josh. But I think that you may be missing the mark as to what this episode really is all about. It isn't always about the things that we do that might be the happiest of moments, because let's face it, we have to do things that don't give us great joy or great pleasure, therefore not contributing to that happiness. But it's about what the long-term aspirations of what our intentions are. That's what makes us create some of the best opportunities in our lives to either be happy or not. It's about the books that we read. It's about the television shows that we might spend time watching. It might be some of the close associations of the people that might all, in accumulation, make us happy or make us not happy. But you have to address this from the many different angles that it comes from. It isn't just about doing one thing and thinking that once you perfect that, you'll be okay. It's simply not true. There's so much more than what meets the eye sometimes when it comes to being happy. But I think that if you overindulge into many different things that are helping you to make yourself happy, you might be also missing the mark. Because it isn't just about having an underindulgence or having an overindulgence of being happy. It's about really meeting the balance of what you can be from not only helping others, helping yourself, but also interacting with the various other modalities in life that you have to interact with. So it's really about finding that platform that makes you really happy to begin with. Don't know what I mean? Let's break it down an example. Say for me, I wanted to have something that makes me happy all the time. Well, if that was the case, I would be strapping on my hiking boots, getting my sticks out, putting my backpack together, and be hiking on the Appalachian Trail every time something goes wrong. Because I'm so fortunate enough to live close to where the Appalachian Trail connects. And I would be able to hike either south or north. It doesn't matter. Whatever way I want to go on the Appalachian Trail, I can do that. I have that opportunity. But the question is, is that really reasonable to do every time something goes wrong? Absolutely not. I have a job. Matter of fact, two jobs. I have to appease for both of those jobs in order to create the opportunity that I can have down the road, if I really wanted to, to work on the Appalachian Trail from the northern point to the southern point where it ends. I can do that. But that isn't balanced. That's an overindulgence. Now, at the same turn, if it was something that I was reading that I really enjoyed, that I wanted to continue reading, but then I put it to the side and I forgot about it, and then after that amount of time that passes by before I realize that I haven't read that book in a while, that it might be time to pick it up again, and then I forgot where I was even at. Does that make me happy that I have to start all over? Probably not, because that was a really good reading of a book that I had in my hand. Now I have an underindulgence. The right balance is that I can take short sprints on the Appalachian Trail and continuously have a schedule in which I read at least 20 to 30 pages a day of a book just so that I can keep abreast of everything that I want to do in terms of my time management. That would make me happy. But that's just one platform out of many things that we can address to create the opportunities that we have in our lives to be happy. The tools and the concepts that Pereira even mentions about writing things out, dealing with the past, helping you flush out that negativity so that you can be happy with who you are, are just some of the basic building blocks that might help you to get started. It doesn't mean that you have to know it all, and it doesn't mean that you have to be happy every day because we are emotional creatures. And if there's anybody that knows who is an emotional creature, it is me, myself, and I, your podcast host, that has struggled from time and time again of the emotional roller coaster that takes place in my life. But I think we all have those emotional roller coasters 
because of the various things that are demands in our time. Not only of our time, but also of our space. The occupation of the things that we need to work on in order to have the quality that we desire. Whether that is with our significant other, whether that's with our children if we have them, whether it's even with our mom and dad that might be still living to this day. Regardless of the motivation or even the technique in which you're trying to utilize, it's really about understanding what those thoughts and perceptions are that help to create not just that happiness that you have, but that ability to keep moving forward, to keep thinking that positive angle in your life is really important to maintain. It really begs the question, should I look for sadness? And I think this is the antithesis of really this whole entire conversation. Don't take that time to look for sadness. If you're wanting to give it space, if you really are trying to give it an opportunity to grow, you don't look out for that sadness. You look out for the happiness. And as much as sadness wants to creep up in our hearts and minds from time to time, especially if we have that as a medical condition, which is true with the things that we have learned in the science of depression and anxiety over the last 10 and 20 years, we know for a fact that sadness can crawl into our brains and make us feel like we are just sacks of nothingness. But we don't have to choose that path. We have a constant opportunity to keep moving forward and keep choosing the things that we want to choose in order to create that best value of who we are. So the next time that you want to feel sad, you're allowing it to occupy that space. Don't do it. You can be a happy person. And I think Pirette demonstrates today the importance of being able to understand that happiness is a choice, a very conscious choice. And in the matter of those choices that we have, one thing rings true. We don't have to sit in that forever. We don't have to sit in that happiness all the time. But it is okay to have that perspective of happiness no matter where we go. But we don't have to be part of the group as a whole, not being happy. Because I think happiness doesn't just come from what's in the inside, but what we experience on the outside. So next time that you're walking down the street, or you're walking to your office, or you're on that video chat with someone, give them a smile. Make sure it's from cheek to cheek. And let those people know that you are showing that distinguishment of happiness. You might not be feeling it, but that other person might feel it for the better. And I think that's what really matters the most. That we can all be happier, no matter what we're going through. Because we have that ability to project whether we're happy or sad. I'd rather be happy more than anything else. And I'd rather see your happy face as I'm walking to my office, walking to my car, maybe even on that video chat the next time I see you. Because happiness is not just a gift. It's an honor to receive. Thanks for listening to episode number 84 of Speaking from the Heart. And I look forward to hearing from your heart very soon. Thanks for listening. For more information about our podcast and future shows, search for Speaking from the Heart to subscribe and be notified wherever you listen to your podcasts. Visit us at www.yourspeakingvoice.biz for more information about potential services that can help you create the best version of yourself. See you next time.